Welcome to the Fire These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jerry Ayub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations at the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. So this is a conversation with Reem Sarah Alwan. She is a French legal academic, commentator and PhD candidate in law, researching religious freedom, human rights and civil liberties in France, Europe and North America. We spoke primarily about a recent piece that she wrote entitled A Spectre in France's Public Debate, Islam or Leftism for Reset Dialogues. So the topics that we discussed are uh, first is what the hell is Islam or leftism in the first place? How these fringe conspiracy theories are being mainstreamed in France? The curious role of anti-American sentiments in propagating these phenomena in France? Uh, understanding the specificity of French laicite or secularism? Uh, we spoke about how the youth generally are more comfortable with multiculturalism, which is provoking a conservative backlash. Uh, We discussed the slippery slope of what is being normalized more broadly, including the security laws being passed. We even explored the links between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, in terms of political rhetoric especially, as well as the legacy of colonial thinking and the personal cost of rising authoritarianism in France. So that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and take care, folks. My name is uh, Rem Sarah Alwan. I am a French uh, legal academic and a PhD candidate at the University of Toulouse Capital. My research uh, mainly focus on constitutional law, comparative law especially, and uh, civil liberties, uh, religious freedom, and uh, um, human rights. The title of your piece, uh, the one we'll be focusing on in this chat, is called uh, is called A Spectre in France's Public Debate, Islam or Leftism. Uh, and you published this on Reset Dialogues. So, okay, so for, just for some background, can you tell us a bit about the piece? Uh, why why was it important to write? And for anyone who is not in France, what the hell is Islam or leftism in the first place? Uh, just kind of some background. <laughs> so you probably know, I mean, everybody knows, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, France, is, like the situation in France is quite uh, disturbing and worrying. And uh, the only thing that our um, Minister of Higher Education and Innovation, uh, Frédéric Vidal, uh, found like to say before, uh, like in an interview, was that uh, she is going to ask for an inquiry on the spread of Islam leftism at universities. Uh, Honestly, at first, I thought it was a joke. I thought like it literally was uh, le gorafi, which is like the equivalent, the French equivalent of the onion. And then I realized it was not a joke. Was I surprised? No, because it's not something new. But why did I write that piece? Because um, I am a a young scholar. Uh, I am doing my PhD on a topic that is very touchy, very tough, very complicated, very heavy. Uh, in law, <laughs> don't add, you know, the, the whole uh, difficulty. And I couldn't stay silent because those kind of uh, basis com- uh, um, accusations, uh, those conspiracy theories, really, uh, reminded me of a very dark time in our history, and especially the 30s. <laughs> uh, and for those who know a bit of the history of Europe, uh, I think you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and also the accusation at that time of the so-called Judeo-Masonic lobby and all the attacks that eventually ended, ended, with, uh, ended up uh, with the cleansing of universities and academics under uh, the Vichy regime uh, in, uh, in the 40s. It's not good news and uh, I... I felt that I need, like, I needed to um, to tell people what's going on and uh, how dangerous this kind of narrative is, and 
how it is the continuity of an ongoing um, uh, an ongoing practice from uh, the authorities to target and attempt to limit civil liberties. The idea of Islam of leftism should have rung some bells as well. Uh, Judeo Masonic thing we we know as well, but even. Judeo Bolshevism and Jewish yeah. Bolshevism, those were things that were also spread in the 30s. And sort of parallel to what we saw under Trump as well, with a kind of a normalization of these kinds of anti Semitic uh, rhetoric in, in, uh, in the US, it started off as fringe ideas, fringe conspiracy theories, and these things through the internet, through various machineries that these days I think many people are familiar with. We're no longer talking in the context of France here. We're no longer talking about fringe ideas anymore, are we? Well, unfortunately, these are fringe ideas that are being mainstreamed. So all of these conspiracy theories that literally nobody knows about are now becoming the new normal because we have certain type of media as well that are spreading them. Like France has an equivalent of Fox News now. It's called C News. And you are asking me what the hell is Islamo leftism, and I want to <laughs> respond. That's a very good question. Uh, like I mentioned in my piece, uh, this I don't even want to call it a concept because it's not a concept. It's it, it, it is like some weird ideology, and the, this ideology, this idea, was first coined by um, by uh, the French philosopher Pierre André Taguieff. To basically, essentially, and I don't want to give him too much uh, airtime, to, to talk about, to, to call out, to designate uh, the, the alliances between uh, the far left and especially the Marxist and Islamists in the UK and in France. And this, so Islamo leftism uh, was used by neocons in France uh, to basically target and go after progressive movements and uh, trying to discredit activists, uh, you know, who are working on issues related to discrimination, race, intersectionality, gender, women's rights, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And basically, the idea is the more you are working on this issue, the most likely you are going to be accused to side with terrorists, and especially at the moment, Islamists and Islamist terrorists. And these attacks on French academy, uh, academia and French universities is also driven by a very strong anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-Muslim hatred. So it's a, company, uh, it's a combo of both. And add up to that, that uh, since uh, those accusations, you know, uh, and actually the Minister of uh, National Education this time, Jean-Michel Blanquer, um, declared like it comes from American campuses. So there is also a strong anti-USA sentiment, anti-Americanism sentiment uh, that is added on top of that. And basically implying that anything that comes from America, you know, which is a multiple country who works on this issue is a threat to France. Again, it's all conspiracy theory. It's all, uh, you know, divide and conquer. And unfortunately, again, it is not a new phenomenon. It didn't start, it, it didn't start sorry, with Frédéric Vidal or Jean-Michel Blanquer, um, you know, uh, accusations. Uh, even back um, after the first wave of terrorist attacks in the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo especially, uh, and I mentioned that in my piece too, uh, Manuel Valls, our former prime minister, who is a socialist, right, uh, basically accused uh, sociologists who try to understand the phenomenon of radicalization, you know, because you need to understand the phenomenon to be able to counter it, to find solutions. Uh, saying something in the I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the quote uh, in front of me, but um, trying to understand is already trying to excuse, which is which is a very harsh thing to do, and it kept it kept going. So every time an anti-racism group or even academics working on this issue raise those issues, they are accused of siding with terrorism, and their name are trash. And finally, add on top of that within academia, 
you do have a fringe of academics who are fighting this kind of movements. And the idea is really that all of this group of people want to erase a huge chunk of field of studies, of uh, areas of studies, of research that are related to humanities and social sciences. So that's a bit, of course, I mean, there is so much to say, but just to give you an idea, I hope it makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, even the, the French Minister of Education, I have the tweet uh, that you had posted um, in October. He had declared not just American University, but he specifically cited intersectionality uh, as responsible for the rise of Islamism and the fragmentation of French society, which is which is in, ex extraordinary to me. Okay, so let's let's um, ground listeners who I don't I can I can sort of get statistics from where most people listen. Uh, there's quite a few from France, so there, there might be already some people already know what we're talking about. But there's quite a, there's quite a bit from the US, from the UK, from from the rest of Europe and the Middle East as well. So if we can sort of just provide some historical background to the specific French context of laïcité, which is different from secularism, as someone who went to, to a laïc school in Lebanon, I know this very well. And I and here I quote a section from your, from your uh, essay, uh, quoting, uh, France's constitution is grounded on Republican theories which emerged during the century of enlightenment and crystallized during the French Revolution of 1789. Uh, republicanism stresses a universalist French identity that supersedes individual, cultural, social, or religious belonging, as opposed to an American-style multiculturalism that seeks public respect of cultural diversity. It is the growing popularity of the latter among French citizens that has brought this issue to a head." End quote. When I was reading this, I thought of that segment of uh, Trevor Noah's show that he was, um, it was after the World Cup and he had made a joke that, you know, it was uh, also Africa's win when when uh, France won uh, and the minister of something in France reacted or no the ambassador to the US probably the French ambassador reacted very negatively on Twitter and everything saying like you know unlike in America uh, where he like he specifically attacked the hyphenated identities like African American etc etc uh, in France we don't distinguish between blah 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 etc etc and you know he re I mean, people can just find this. He reacted in a certain way, Trevor Noah, in a funny way, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, that, but there are two things in the paragraph itself. Um, one, the specific form of republicanism, uh, which is different from American republicanism, Irish republicanism. It's just it's a it's a specific French thing. So we can just say laïcité to distinguish between the two. So that's one thing, if that's okay. And the second thing, uh, which I mean, I can just ask a bit later again on the growing popularity of multiculturalism in France, uh, especially among the younger generation, like that specific phenomenon, and why is it such a threat to the people who oppose it? Let's put it that way. So I hope I won't bore your audience too much. Uh, and there is a lot of things to say, but I need to give you some historical background. Like I cannot just answer the question like that without giving you some elements of knowledge, so you can just put into context uh, everything. So, yeah, so um, France is a constitutional republic, right? Uh, currently governed by the constitution of 1958, so we are under the Fifth Republic, uh, and it is grounded on uh, republican theories, um, which emerged during the Enlightenment, and, uh, and uh, which was um, really put into place, crystallized uh, during the revolution. Of course, it's a process. It didn't start with the revolution, but the revolution was like a bit of a starting point, right? And, you know, although France is a country of immigrants because of our past, we are a country uh, colonized many other countries and we are still, and we will talk about it a bit later, I guess, uh, we are, we did, still did not make peace with that, really. Uh, it is a country of Frenchmen. And uh, despite its cultural uh, diversity, France is one of the most multi-ethnic, multi-diverse, multicultural country in Western Europe. Yet, it is a monocultural society, and I will explain that. Uh, the notion of assimilation um, is uh, ideologically um, fundamental to French republicanism uh, that coincides, if you want, um, how to say, it, with, with the notions of uh, universalism, pluralism, 
and secularism. And of course, I will focus especially on universalism and secularism, which we call in front laicite, because for me, laicite is a form of secularism. And I will explain a little bit uh, why I think it's that way. And assimilation is, if you want, the sine qua non condition to citizenship. So meaning that, for example, immigrants who want to become French uh, should adopt the French culture, even though this notion of cultures or even values are nowhere to be defined, uh, and reject others' values. And uh, republicanism in France is traditionally defined in its universalist um, nature, and uh, meaning that in France, like the French identity, if you want, transcends particularism. Uh, transcend any cultural, any social, any religious uh, belonging um, in order to achieve individual autonomy. Um, that's a bit uh, the idea, as opposed to multiculturalism, uh, which can be found especially in the Anglo-American world, uh, which traditionally seeks the, seeks, uh, the, the um, official, sometimes even legal, recognition of uh, cultural diversity. And um, rep republicanism, sorry, uh, presupposes that the state is free from any influence uh, from, for example, the church and religion. And that's when I'm going to talk about the laicite. Uh, laicite is a very interesting concept. Um, it found its roots in, uh, in the revolution, actually. We, we, because of the history, the very chaotic <laughs> history we have with uh, the Roman Catholic Church, especially, France is suspicious towards religion in general. France hates religion, really. And between you and I and everybody who is listening, <laughs> uh, one of France's dream is really to control religion, right? I mean, let's be honest about it. But uh, fast forward to 8082, uh, so we are uh, at the beginning uh, of, uh, I mean, the end, uh, 1882, so uh, 19th century. Um, it was at school that this notion was implemented first, because school is considered in France the place where you are going to make the French citizen. And to be able to do that, you need to remove the Catholic Church influence uh, from education. So uh, under Jules Ferry, who at that time was a minister of instruction, meaning education, um, he passed a series of law on public education. And for example, he replaced religious moral which at the time was a thing like teaching a religious moral to kids with civic moral. So it was, again, it, the idea was not to remove religion because I mean, religion is part of society too, but to, uh, for the French, uh, the only way for you to uh, be able to be a citizen is to be free from religion too. And then of course, fast forward, to uh, 1905, um, we adopted the law on separation of churches and state, uh, which is basically the foundation of the management of state and religious uh, state and religion uh, in this country. Uh, fun fact: laicite does not appear in the law at all. It's until 1946 that uh, the Constitution of 1946 mentioned laicite. But in the law, actually, it's nowhere to be found. Uh, this law is actually quite simple, and it's a law of appeasement, because you had two schools that fought each other during the debates that preceded the, um, uh, sorry, that uh, happened before uh, the adoption of the law. Those who really wanted to get rid of religion, no more religion, uh, the public square has to be neutral, nothing. and. The vision of laicity, which won over actually in the law, uh, which was not anti-religion at all, but it was anti-clerical. 
So it's more the power of the church in terms of influence within the, the political uh, structure, the government structure. And the idea was simple, to be able to protect freedom of religion, but also freedom of conscience. So the right to believe, to not believe, to change religion, uh, to maybe one day have a religion or not, uh, you need to have to impose the neutrality of the state, meaning that the state does not recognize or have a favorite religion and they must remain neutral. So civil servants are neutral. Religious neutrality is imposed upon the state, not upon private individuals who are free to exercise their right to freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. And that was the idea. The idea really was not to, uh, to prevent the visibility of religion uh, from happening. I'm not saying that it was all unicorn, glitter, and rainbows, because there was anti-religion sentiment, of course, especially against the Catholic. And for those who, who knows about <laughs> from the French history with religion, we have a very <laughs> dark history. Like, we are not good with that. But the idea really was to appease everybody. And that's pretty much it. Now the problem we have today, and uh, pardon, like I'm trying to really give you the big lines. The problem we have today is, so the law of 1905, in my opinion, is very liberal. If, uh, in other words, if I want to compare with the United States, for example, in the US, uh, they have a wall of separation between religion and the state, um, especially, so it was theorized by, um, uh, Roger Williams, the founder of the state of Rhode Island, uh, the idea that nobody interfered with each other. And it was made in a way that religion, believers, are protected against the potential abuses from the state. And in a way, I think America is a like country, but their views is that you can be as religious or a religious or atheist as you are, you are protected because as an individual, you have a right to think what you want. In France, it's the other way around. We want to protect the state from the abuses of religion. So in France, religious freedom has limits. It's public order, right? So it's very interesting to see that. So it was, uh, for the French, it was a liberal law, really. Now, problem is, Today, um, this very liberal vision has been transformed into a tool to target religious minorities and especially Muslims and Islam. And uh, it has been like 30 years, but again, you need to take into account our colonial past and the way we treated the Muslims in our colonies. And I'm especially thinking of Algeria, but not only. And uh, now, laicity is used, has been transformed into some sort of monsters that really have nothing to do with the law of 1905. Now we have this, this restricted view of laicity, which implies the er, like erasing any view of religion. And I think it goes against the spirit of uh, 1905, of the law of 1905. And uh, I think it's dangerous. I think we went from a liberal interpretation to an illiberal one, but one of the problem again with laicite is that if its historical definition is agreed upon, like nobody really uh, disagree with the history, there is no legal definition of laicite. Meaning that, and I think it was done on purpose by the lawmakers at, some at, at the time, meaning that when you don't have a definition, it's open and you can have a very liberal definition of laicity depending on you know, time, political time, like uh, the situation, the context and a very restrictive one. And I think that's the main issue today. Sorry if I was too long. No, no, this was perfect. Thanks a lot for that. The second part of the question, which I said I'll bring up again is the, the I mean, especially among the youth, I guess there's a bigger ease. I think it's fair to say with the notion of a multiculturalism, with the notion that, you know, you can be more than one thing at a time. And this is definitely making a lot of 
people, especially people in power and on the right, but not just on the right, which is uh, part of the problem, um, fairly uncomfortable. So can you talk a bit about uh, that, that phenomenon as well? Yes, like I said, anything that comes from the Anglo-American world is seen as a threat here, <laughs> which is very sad. And I think it speaks volume more about the people in power and that those who actually feel comfortable enough in their identity to promote it in a way that is uh, faithful to the French tradition, right? Um, like I mentioned, the Republican tradition still holds very strong within uh, French society. Um, and uh, social policies in France have emphasizes really in this notion of assimilation. To which I would ask, assimilation to what? To what? I mean, most of the time we talk about mainland France and I will make the connection with multiculturalism afterwards. Uh, we tend to forget that we have overseas territories that are French there. I mean, it's France, right? Uh, I don't know, Guyana, Guadeloupe, New Caledonia, uh, Mayotte, La Réunion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is Futuna, um, French Polynesia. Uh, their culture is very different from ours and it's okay. <laughs> That's what makes France so vibrant and dynamic and awesome. So assimilating to what exactly? What kind of values are we talking about? And I think we all know the answer. The answer is that those in power want to remain the one in power and dominate other groups that are more vulnerable. Saying the minorities as in, you know, people of immigrant background, especially. And I think that one of the reasons uh, I'm not saying it explains everything, but I think it's a really good and important start. We are a country in denial. We still to refuse to see our past, to make peace with our past, to repair our past, to move forward to a better future, right? Colonialism in France, I mean, of course, uh, historians, it's not the taboo for historians, activists, researchers, because everybody studied it. And, but for those in power, it's still a sore topic. Colonialism is in the past and you know, like we still talk about like the positive effects of colonialism. Can you imagine that? Like what kind of positive, I mean, it's, it's wild. <laughs> and uh, today you have voices from people, especially of immigrant background who are like, hello, we need to do something about it. And I think, the main issue with the political establishment is that they still do not accept the fact that the second, third generation of children are French and consider themselves as French. Because for years, and it's still going on now, we still don't consider this population as part of the fabric of this country, even though these people and the immigrants who came in this country after decolonization built this country, right? It's racism. I mean, let's, let's put words on the, like, on the phenomenon. Uh, we still have this view, oh, there is no racism. We're not America. We don't see color. We are a colorblind nation. We are a universalist country. You know what? In theory, I would agree. Yes, it's great that we are universal. We don't see you as uh, a minority, like we see you as a human being that deserves protection because of his human being condition. But come on, in practice, um, discrimination are rising. Uh, you have more chance to get a job if you're, if you're white and your name is Jean-Claude uh, than if you're black or of North African background and name is Mohammed. And I'm not the one just saying that, there are reports about it. We have an ombudsman uh, the Defenseur des Droits, so the Defender of uh, Rights, who constantly write reports about that. Racial profiling, we can talk for, like it's another topic for another time, but we do have issues with racial profiling, uh, economic disparities, uh, no social mobility. And we are, I think, using universalism as a way to remain blind, like we cannot be racist, we don't see color. What are you talking about? We are not America. We always come back to we are not America. Well, we're not talking about America here. We're talking about this country. And I think 
the problem is today uh, the 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 structure the power its structure are shaken because they are not it's not sustainable it will fall apart at some point but it will get worse before it gets better i think uh the we, we are not america just makes me a bit giggle sometimes just because in the uk it's always we are not europe and it's just <laughs> <laughs> they 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 each yeah. have their own they they each have their own we are not it's always defined in the negative, um, but I, I'll definitely come back to UK France comparison because it ties to a previous episode I did as well, but as it happens, um, just a few days before we we were recording this and we're recording this on April the 9th, two thousand twenty one just for the record, it was announced that uh, l'Observatoire de la Laïcité the Observatory of Laïcité Observatory of Secularism would be shut down. And uh, this is, it's a big deal. Uh, it hasn't gotten the coverage it should be getting outside of France, as far as I know. Um, but it, it goes back to what you were talking about, about the importance of different interpretations and how this is actually threatening some people in power. So uh, to that end, can you explain the role of, of the observatory uh, and the significance of this move by the, the, minister, the minister delegate of citizenship? And I will note just before I let you answer, that uh, Jean-Louis Bianco, the the president of the observatory, he 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 asked, why do they want to break a tool that works? And then he answered, we bothered them because we are independent. And so just with that, would you mind just explaining what happened there and who they are and why it's important? So uh, just to give even a more a bit more of, uh, precision regarding the timeline. So uh, technically, so the term of the president and the rapporteur of uh, the observatory of laicity ended on April the second, but the mission of the observatory ends in 2022, so next year. But so I think it's a period of transition, basically. So uh, just to give you some quick background, the observatory of uh, laicity. Um, is basically the guardian of laïcité. Uh, it's a consultancy agency. It's an authority administra administrative independent. It's a uh, consultative um, commission uh, designed to help the government um, to enforce and promote laïcité. Uh, it is, um, sorry to get into the legal details, but it is attached to uh, the prime minister. However, they are quite relatively, not relatively, they are very autonomous and actually independent to use uh, the, 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 the words of uh, Jean-Louis Bianco. Um, they are composed of uh, 23 members, uh, including uh, member of parliaments from across the political spectrum. And I think that's what it makes like it so appealing and so strong is that it's, it's really bring together many um, you know, uh, many views from different political uh, ideologies and ideas. And uh, they also have experts on the topic and uh, highly qualified uh, civil servants that also work uh, for them. So why are we uh, dismantling, why it was announced by uh, Marlene Chiappa that uh, the uh, observatory will be dismantled because they did a job. <laughs> And uh, they explain the law of laicite. Uh, they they did a fantastic work, field work. So they advise the government, but they also give training in public schools as well as private organizations to basically explain the law without any um, form of partisanship. That's the law. That's the rules. That's you know how it works, and and for that basically they refuse to fall into the trap of going after Muslim for the sake of going after Muslims. So what happened is uh, it was heavily criticized for not, for example, going after Muslim women wearing a headscarf because they would explain you in what case the headscarf is prohibited and in what case it's perfectly fine for them to do that. I give you just an example because it was one of the most prominent example. And uh, we have another issue in France is that we have some groups of what they call the fundamental, the fun, like uh, the fundamentalist seculars, secularists, the les laïcs, from the left. Again, it's a fringe, very loud uh, fringe of the left that um, 
you know, the intellectual left, <laughs> uh, who basically are really anti-religion and very anti-Muslim as well. And they have very um, questionable tactics to go after anyone who dare to defend a liberal uh, vision of laicity. And unfortunately, Jean-Louis Bianco and Nicolas Cadem, so the president and the rapporteur, were really victim of campaigns of harassment, of pressure. And these groups managed to influence the state, I think. So I think that's what happened here, is that the government is more into implementing a very restrictive vision of laicity that literally have nothing to do with 1905. And as a proof of that, yesterday there was an article, so we are the ninth, so uh, on the eighth, there was an article in Le Monde, an interview of Jean-Michel Blanquer, so the uh, Minister of National Education, who literally admitted that he succeeded in implementing his restrictive view of laicity. Um, I have written extensively about it. That's what I call the weaponization of laicity. The same way some would use religion for their political agenda. And there are a lot of countries who are doing that. Uh, in France, we are using laicity to fulfill ours, to make sure that laicity is not about freedom, but is about restriction and targeting certain groups we deem incapable of integrating, the Muslims. And unfortunately, uh, this comes at a time when I think we need the observatory more than ever because they bring sanity to this madness. They are the only ones who actually had the line and just explain the law. Apparently, so we don't have any further details, but they are going to replace it with another institution that might be a, like a sort of administration of laicite, so for administrer la laicite. And I'm afraid, I hope to be wrong on this one. So what I'm saying is not what is going to happen, it's what I fear will happen, just so we're clear. I fear that we are going to replace the observatory with an institution that will be, which goal will be to be the police of laicite. And I hope to be wrong on this one because it, it, it's not good news. It's really no good news at all. Uh, I mean, I, I have the same fear. And I mean, just to add to what you were saying about uh, Belanque, he even said that it's a challenge for civilization. And for me, as soon as you use the C word, civilization, that's when uh, a lot of the red flags uh, you know, start uh, popping up in my mind. But um, the day after uh, that announcement, so like on April 6th, to keep track of time, uh, this is also, you, you tweeted about this, a right-wing senator said, and I quote, we need to refuse prayers in the hallways of universities, end quote, implying Muslim prayers. Uh, putting aside that we're in the middle of a pandemic and there aren't that many classes, um, you and many others, I just saw random people responding in the same way, they're saying, well, I've been in the university for five years and I've never seen that happening. And, you know, many people are basically saying the same thing. But of course, the, to me, again, from where I'm standing, from like an anti-authoritarian and just something that I try and keep track of in different places, usually when such thing, when such comments become more and more open and more normalized, we would say, it becomes a slippery slope into then what what ends up becoming because they, they kind of shift the center of what is becoming yeah normalized i'm repeating myself but like the center of what's becoming normal to talk about and in this case it's becoming more and more right wing we might say even with the complicity of many on the left as you said and i'll, I'll get more into that for sure <laughs> i have a lot to say on this um so yeah my question i guess is maybe a repetition i'm not sure just asking you a reflection on the slippery slope of maybe even in legal terms you may have more insight definitely than i do in where this can lead in terms of what gets normalized uh, if that makes sense <laughs> same actually when i uh listened to this mp who wanted to pass an amendment on uh i mean declaring like what you just uh like we need to stop prayer. I mean, I have been at university for way too long. <laughs> I thought it was also a gorafi. Like, I'm like, it's a joke. Come on. Like, 
I have never seen that in my life. Uh, we have a, like 99 problems at the university, but praying in the whole way is uh, not one of them. Um, I mean, the worst problem we have, besides that the Wi-Fi never working, is that research is underfunded, our researchers are all leaving, and uh, the, there is a rise of student poverty. Uh, many of them during the pandemic are mentally struggling, some try to commit suicide. And the priority of some is to prohibit prayers in the hallway. Honestly, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even surprised, but problem is like, we have a saying in French, uh, plus c'est gros, plus ça passe. Meaning uh, roughly, uh, the bigger the lie is, the most likely people are starting to going to believe it. And by the way, I put Islamo-leftism in the same category. Uh, nobody heard about islamo left. I mean, the people, I mean, those who have been following and, you know, the, the debates, of course. But um, as soon as you throw something and, you know, uh, start to play with this notion that uh, this is a threat, we need to be careful, we are going to legislate on it. You play with fears, with people's fears, because people want security. So of course people will start believing it, right? And is it a slippery slope? I would say it's more than a slippery slope. It's, uh, it's authoritarian methods. And I do not use that word slightly. Uh, I, I don't like to use the A word uh, just for the sake, like fascist or whatever. Like I, I use that very cautiously, uh, but we are no better than many uh, in terms of strategy. I mean, uh, because of course I will never compare the situation of France with uh, those of the people who actually live and have to go through the, I mean, through authoritarian regimes. Um, but it, it is the same method. You know, you target a group of people, uh, whether it's like the Muslims or the, the you know, women's rights uh, activists, or LGBTQ plus activists, et cetera, you consider them a threat and you are going to make things up to be able to pass legislation to justify more restriction of civil liberties. And that's what's currently going on in France. There is not a year in this country without us passing a law restricting civil liberties even more. And that's the issue, you know, we use Muslims today, but after Muslims, they would go after another group of people. And uh, it's not the new kind of phenomenon. Again, go back to history. That's how it starts, right? And again, I don't want to sound alarmist. And I know that today compared to uh, years ago, we now have uh, legal ways to counter that. But still, it is dangerous. It is extremely dangerous and worrying because now we don't care about the rule of law anymore. Actually, they would tell that to your first. The rule of law uh, does not allow us to fight terrorism. So yes, we need to bypass it when it can. We are talking about people who are, you know, even working for courts saying that, right? So um, yes, unfortunately, that's how the verification process uh, works. You target someone, you make things up, or, or if it's like a marginal phenomenon, you make it bigger than it is. And instead of opening a debate, for example, or, or, and I mean, you don't even need a debate on something that is completely made up, but like, if you need to talk about certain issues, do it in a civil way. Don't do it in the way to vilify people. So yes, we are, uh, I think we crossed a, a red line. And unfortunately, I think we reached a point of no return here. And the problem is, and I said that uh, in the beginning of our conversation, the more it's normalized, the more it's mainstream, the more some media will actually condone that without giving a voice to the people affected by these measures, the more we are at risk to see our democracy and its foundation um, falling apart. And unfortunately, we are in the middle of the process. And speaking of just some of the I think this is just one more on the legal side, if that's okay, because I have a lot to rant about, but I'm waiting a bit. Just one more question. <laughs> um, 
the, the, um, there is a direct link between this fear mongering and the state putting forward bills, you know, as you just mentioned, such as, and these are the English title of these bills, uh, the bill is strengthening Republican principles and the bill on global security, red alarms all over the place on both of these things. As you, you know, you mentioned both of those in the piece, I should say. Um, I don't know if this is a repetition. If it is, we can just go to the other one. But can you talk a bit more on uh, maybe these specific bills or if, if there are other bills that I haven't mentioned? Because this will help elucidate uh, the problem, I think, a bit more. No, it's not a repetition at all because everything is connected. Uh, so, um, as you all probably know, France has gone through horrific terrorist attacks. Um, I don't have any words to really qualify. They are, they're horrible. And the latest thing, um, you know, uh, the attacks uh, in Nice against the church and Samuel Paty, uh, these teachers who was slaughtered um, for doing his job, really. And the problem we have in France is that the response to terrorist attacks are is often an emotional response and not a rational one. And I personally believe that it's in time of crisis like this that we need to protect and reinforce civil liberties even more. And we are doing the opposite. So every terrorist attack is used as an excuse to pass laws that violate our, our uh, civil liberties. So in the, end, the bill strengthening uh, Republican uh, principle, which is currently being discussed <laughs> before the set, I mean, they're going wild at the moment, like the passing amendments, uh, which is, by the way, this bill is not even a counterterrorism bill. Uh, in my opinion, it's a bill that literally reshaped the relation between state and religion to control Islam even more. It's, it's, this bill is not, like, you probably heard about this amendment prohibiting uh, the wearing of religious signs for people going on school trips to go with kids. It's targeting Muslim women wearing a headscarf who go on school trip to help teachers, you know, like explain me, like someone explain me with a straight face, how is that going to stop terrorism and stop radicalization? Seriously. Anywho, uh, also the bill on global security and one of the most um, controversial amendments, you know, the prohibition to uh, take pictures of cops uh, during protests. And actually there is uh, one forgotten that has not been really discussed because it's a bit, uh, you know, uh, behind the scene, but like the reform on, uh, on universities and one particular amendment, uh, which was rewritten ever since, uh, but one of the amendments stated, uh, I think I have the quote somewhere, um, stated that basically all uh, lectures, academic freedom is exercised having regard to the values of the Republic. It's straight for, from like the authoritarian playbook. Who decide, who control, what does that even mean? knowing that academic freedom is constitutionally protected, right? So this amendment was uh, meant to die uh, immediately, but damage has done, honestly. It's not the point that it passed or, or didn't pass at this point. It's just, it's here, right? And in the, during the discussion on the big strengthening Republican values, actually many amendments went after universities. And, um, I think that all of these measures are taken to cover our incompetence and failure to actually address terrorism. And um, you have to understand that in France, I mean, France has one of the strongest legal apparatus uh, in matters of countering terrorism. Um, especially, I don't know if you, so after uh, the 2015 uh, terrorist attacks, so Charlie Hebdo, Le Bataclan, et cetera, um, we went through two years of state of emergency. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not normal. It's not normal. And after, so after the end of state of emergency, uh, we adopted a law 
So uh, it was the law on uh, interior security and fight against terrorism of 2017, which essentially, listen that, which essentially made many features of state of emergency laws, which, were, which are extremely restrictive laws in matter of civil liberties uh, into permanent law. And yet we were not able to prevent terrorist attacks from happening. And what are we doing? We are passing more laws to go after civil liberties on the grounds of fighting terrorism and radicalization. And um, yeah, we often use the argument of terrorism to, to, to propose, adopt, work on uh, such types of law. And I think that not only um, the response will not change a thing, but it will most likely worsen the situation uh, by eroding civil liberties and increasing the stigmatization of Muslims, especially, um, who keep being perceived as um, the usual suspect, if I'm making any uh, sense. So uh, unfortunately, like just to conclude a, bit, a little bit this, uh, this matter, uh, there are many signs in the political elites uh, and even some in academia. It's a fringe, but it's still strong, right? The elite that wants to keep basic, because even in academia, there is a structure of power. It's a microcosm. Uh, who are ready to abandon, to give up on the core value of the rule of law and fundamental rights, human rights, civil liberties, now more than ever, uh, need to be defended because they are on trial. They are on trial. And um, like I said, it's in time of crisis that we need the reinforcement, that we need to strengthen civil liberties and human rights. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, on a more like, um, I don't know, maybe abstract level, I guess. But so I wanted to mention a conversation that I had um, recently, it's episode 67 for those listening, with uh, Professor Dave Andres. He is, um, I, I, I'm finding it a bit funny, although maybe I shouldn't, but he is sort of the, the um, he fits a portfolio of what a lot of the people that were complaining about in this chat, uh, the, the sort of person that they would hate the most. Uh, he's English and his specialty is the French Revolution. And he wrote a book called Cultural Dementia, in which he called How the West Lost Its History and Risks Losing Everything Else. That's the subtitle. But in which he explicitly compares uh, France, the UK, and the US. So like taboos all around, basically, on all, on all three sides. And the reason why he focuses on these three, I won't say too much about this, because I mean, the conversation is already very long, uh, like the conversation with him, I mean. But the one of the things worth pointing out from that conversation is how ironically similar just to focus on two of the three the uk and france actually are on many things even though one is a monarchy and one is a republic obviously uh and i mean of course they have their own specificity it's not the same thing um, i don't want to make any uh, blanket statements here but there is in the uk uh we're seeing stuff like obsession over the union flag uh, there's a very good uh, write-up in The Guardian, I'll try and find it and link it, which compares how like in the 90s everyone was fine with the Spice Girls wearing, you know, the Union flag and shoes and socks and everyone was just fine with it and it's actually part of the the idea of not taking ourselves too seriously, ourselves in this case being, as in the, the Brits would say that. This has changed, now it's actually, there are lots of Tory MPs saying that there should be a flag, the Union Jack on every school ground in the UK. Uh, forgetting that on the Union Jack, you don't have the flag of Wales. So that was a bit awkward. Uh, of course, in Scotland, it's uh, sensitive for its Scottish related reasons. Um, but, you know, et cetera, et cetera, just on the flag issue. Uh, there is the fact that so many cops were sent to protect the statue of Winston Churchill on in Trafalgar Square in London uh, from quote unquote woke militants. And here I'm using terms used by the British tabloids, especially. Uh, you have Tory MPs telling the BBC to remember that the B stands for British 
uh, implying that the BBC is now somehow not British enough, even though it's kind of like the quintessential British institution, uh, and so on and so on. In France, it's La République, always caps lock, you know, it has to rip majuscule. Uh, this at once, um, in, in both cases, it's at once apparently strong thing. It's always, you know, in the UK, they would literally say strong and stable. Strong, Theresa May would say strong and stable government. That was the main thing, uh, which collapsed like a few weeks later. And, but it's both strong and stable, but at the same time, it requires constant, constant defending from imagined enemies. And this is where the slippery slope starts happening because the imagined enemies, uh, they cannot always be imagined. You have to you have to um, apply that violence on actual bodies. That's how it's always worked. And so, I mean, the irony of these two former empires, one a monarchy, one a republic, having so much in common, I'm sure lots of people will see the irony in that, especially the, the whole, like, we are not British, and on the other side, we are not French, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'll transition to, the, I just wanted to say that as a kind of a comment. Uh, I want to transition to something that will maybe at first appear off topic, but I think it's actually relevant. So um, I have a, an episode with uh, Daniel Randall. I think it's going to be the one just after this episode, but I'm not, I forgot the timeline. And he's a British uh, Jewish leftist activist, organizer, etc. And he's currently writing a book on the specific phenomenon of left-wing anti-Semitism uh, anti -Semitism in the UK specifically. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I'm reading the book and I'm offering comments. One thing that I've I've come to notice, uh, and this is where I'm like my background as Lebanese, Palestinian, etc., comes into play. Um, issues related to Israel Palestine uh, in France, as in the UK, less so in America, but especially in the UK, I would say, are very rarely about Israelis or Palestinians. It's actually rather about like these two specific countries' own histories and legacies. In the UK, of course, the Balfour Declaration, blah blah, etc. It's a different uh, episode. But one thing that for me, what this shows is just it's another consequence of, of many consequences of the narcissism of post-imperial countries, largely in denial of that imperial past, because there's no point of seeing what's actually happening there. It's all about our relationship, our imagined relationship to that land. Um, our here in the case of France, UK, etc. Brexit is a more obvious example, I think. Uh, in my conversation with Dave Andrews, I mentioned how there was one Tory MP is that during the Olympics, she said that the British Empire was winning the gold medal. And she had just put a map and you had like uh, the Commonwealth, like India and Australia, and they were all part of the British Empire. So it was pretty explicit. Um, and in France, it's, it's also like in the UK, it's just, it's mostly about denying colonialism and its legacies, but also denying, and this is where the anti-Semitism comes into play, the role of France in the Holocaust. And this is something that many people don't really understand, so I just wanted to bring it up. And I'll, so I'll mention that example. When it comes to France, the relationship to the past is one which alternates between, I mean, from my standpoint, occasional recognition, usually surface level, sometimes there's some recognition, Macron while campaigning, he sort of recognized some horrors, but you know, surface level. Um, and it alternates between that and obsessive repetition. <laughs> So in the fact that Macron and Chirac, to their credit, I don't want to credit them too much, but to their credit on that specific thing, to be fair, the fact that they even mentioned France's Nazi past was enough to provoke a huge backlash from both the right, which is expected, but also from the left. And this is where, for me, the anti-authoritarianism priorities come into play. Um, Macron, uh, Chirac recognized that there were, there were crimes happening. Macron more specifically said that, uh, let me find it, that there is official French culpability in the Holocaust because of the role, I mean, because of the role of the French, and obviously the Vichy regime. Uh, both Mélenchon on the left and Le Pen on the right, far right, agree on the fact that this was not France that committed these things because for them, France i.e. the Republic equals the Republic, and the Republic was in exile in London with the Gaulle. I'm going to put aside the irony of France being in London with Brexit and everything, but let's put that aside. Um, <laughs> with that in mind, what they are saying is that France was not France. And so it's very easy, if you start with that, 
we said, well, it wasn't us. Like, uh, you know, th that wasn't us, even though it was us. <laughs> it was France. Uh, it was part of the French. And of course, this doesn't deny the French resistance. On the contrary, they were resisting an internal enemy uh, in addition to the external enemy, the Nazi occupation. But this denies the fact that it was the French police and the French gendarmes that decided to arrest and deport 13,152 Jews in the in, in France. It's called the Raf du Veldiv, Veldiv Roundup in English. So, so this is kind of some of the background. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is that there is increasing talk in some anti-authoritarian circles, and I just want to make it a bit more well known. I think it's not that as mainstream as I would hope it would be that the general hostility towards or fear of the past goes even beyond Islamophobia. And it just takes different manifestation. Islamophobia in both the UK and especially in France, sometimes even more than the UK, to be honest, uh, or at least more blatantly, let's put it that way. The UK has a lot of Islamophobia, don't get me wrong, is the sort of the, the first point. It's what they actually use to, to attack the past or to deny the past, because in this case, not to be too metaphorical about it, but it's also about denying the colonial past. And so for me, when I hear that, it serves almost a specific, um, or when I hear the sort of light quote unquote Holocaust denialism of the whole, the, the variety of Mélenchon and Le Pen, because that's what it is. I, I, I have to be uh, blatant about it. Um, is a sort of a can canary in a coal mine situation. They all like, as it's so, to paraphrase a, an activist called Vicky Osterweil, uh, it's a dual scapegoat of like the Jew within and the Muslim without, you know, like it's both like, A, there's an enemy from within, but there's also an enemy coming from without. And you always have to fight off these enemies and which one takes the priority actually has to do with today's politics. So I'm rambling a bit, sorry. But so my question to you, to go back to you, so I don't just stop on my, on my, on my own. And it's a bit more abstract, but... In the UK, as I said, I would argue that both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are common. They take the different forms. Uh, they don't affect political culture in the same way in the immediate terms. Islamophobia has more political capital. It's just easier uh, for various reasons. In France as well, it is easier for various reasons. Although in France, as the example of the Valdiv shows, anti-Semitism can exist not even below the surface. But it's just it, they don't call it that, so it doesn't get called that, and they get they have the power to name what they want to name. So my question to you, and I hope this all of this made sense. But my question to you is: Do you see links uh, between these two, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia? Maybe in terms of the law, I'm not too sure about that. But in terms of political rhetoric, we mentioned the comparisons to the 30s. I know this gets thrown a lot and I don't want to take it further than where we should in some ways, but there is an, a real and objective reason as to why some of these alarm bells should, should ring essentially. So this question to you, sorry, <laughs> specifically about the inability on willingness in France to confront this past, do you see these par uh, parallels, maybe not with America, because it's kind of a different situation, but at least with the UK? Because for me, it's as clear as, as they and, and the way where I stand anyway. Actually, I just want to make justice to your brilliant comments and observations. So uh, <laughs> um, I hope I will. Uh, no, I, I do agree with you. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, sorry if it, like, it's not completely uh, connected. I would just uh, throw that away. First of all, um, anti-Semitism is still going very strong in France. Uh, it's horrific, it's disgusting, and um, it, it's very concerning to see that, um, you know, so much hatred, uh, and you said it from across the political, you know, spectrum, from the far right to the far left, is still going on against our Jewish communities who do not feel safe in France in 2021. Even worse, uh, we are actually using uh, the Jews today as a way to go after Muslims. So for example, uh, and basically uh, the, the Jewish communities are being used as, as, uh, as pawn if you want to, you know, divide and conquer, it's really what it is. And which is a very colonial kind of uh, mindset, I think. 
Uh, meaning, for example, I, I just give you this example because it comes, uh, it actually comes very often in our current debate. So when we talk about the hijab or anything that is like related to Muslims and flavored with strong anti-Muslim sentiment, to, so to justify the anti-Muslim hatred, some would argue politicians, but also pundits, some intellectuals, uh, you like Islam cannot it cannot fit in Europe. Islam cannot fit in France because your values violate the quote unquote the Judeo Christian values. Doesn't fit into I quote the Judeo Christian civil civilization, to which I always respond uh, the Judeo part of Judeo Christian values before or after the Holocaust before or after the Dreyfus Affair. We are the country of the Dreyfus Affair. Like we, for those uh, who, who are not familiar, uh, I mean, I cannot stop talking about this, but it's the case where a um, French soldier was accused of treason, uh, even though actually he didn't do it. It was a coup uh, and um, he was um, dismissed from the army. Uh, all of his honors were removed. And it was not after years um, that we discovered the plot. And uh, the whole case was um, fed with anti-Semitism. And you probably all know Jacques, right? And um, so it's all, and, and you had the pro and the anti dreyfusard So France was divided in two. And it's still the case today somehow. I mean, of course, it's not the same situation and, and so on, but it's still here. We still like, and I think uh, maybe that's the similarity with Muslim. We still perceive Jews as others, as people who are not part of this country. And I think it's horrific. I think it's horrible. All conspiracy theories are always uh, based on, you know, Judaism and Jews and, oh, it's COVID. It's a conspiracy from the Jews. Oh my God, stop it. I mean, it's so, it's so ridiculous and dangerous. And unfortunately, this uh, divide and conquer mentality um, works in some circle. Oh, we are going to protect the Jews, but not the Muslims, even though actually both categories deserve, and it's not the mistake of the Jews, it's really the same elite, like it's white supremacy, I'm going to use the word. It's another form of white supremacy. And to keep going on uh, colonialism and the monarchy visa republic, I always joke, but actually I half joke, and I know I receive hatred after saying that, but that's fine. I'm used to it. Uh, France is a republic that I think is still governed like the ancient regime. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be honest, we are still governed like under a monarchy, except that today it's not a king. It's like a president that gets all the powers and the executive is reinforced and all the region, the département are basically fief. You know, like in the Middle Age, if you listen to, you know, the election comments, it's like le fief, so the land of X, Y, Z politician. I'm like, hey, dude, <laughs> it's a republic. It's not <laughs> like you're not a lord. And we are like the peasants. Uh, when I use that word, it's like the, you know, third estate, right? Uh, so, so it's very interesting. And to connect everything to colonialism, and I think I briefly mentioned this uh, a bit earlier, like in our conversation, um, we, France is still governed by its colonial mindset. It still doesn't get rid of it because that's how it works. And the problem is the more they are called out on that, they know it's not sustainable. I think that's what I mentioned previously. I will give credit to Chirac and Macron on those issues. So indeed with Chirac for the first time, if you take the war of Algeria, the reason why I take Algeria, uh, I don't want like, to dismiss other countries. It's absolutely not what I'm doing. Uh, Morocco suffered, Tunisia suffered, um, Mauritania, Senegal, like Sub-Saharan Africa, don't get me wrong. But the thing with Algeria is that at that time, um, it was not just a protectorate. It was a, Fr a French department, as in a French province. So, you know, uh, basically the day of the independence when France uh, lost Algeria, let's say it's like if the US lost Texas or California. It, just to give you like an idea for the picture, right? And um, essentially, um, Chirac, for the first time, 
talk about a war of Algeria. Until then, we talk about the events. It was just a public order disturbance. Fun fact for our listeners, state of emergency laws were born under the, I, I mean, the, the war of Algeria, the quote unquote public order disturbance. No, it was not a public order disturbance. It's people who were, uh, you know, who, who didn't have any rights, who were controlled, colonized, uh, whose worst crimes were committed against them, who basically wanted to be free. They were fighting for their freedoms because they were not treated as human as equal with the other French citizens. They were in, quote, you know, uh, les indigènes, the indigenous. They didn't have the same rights because they were Muslims, because Muslims were dead incapable of integrating. Islam was not a religion uh, that, you know, uh, was able to fit into, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, into that culture. A decree gave rights to the Jews. So, you know, divide and conquer. But the Jews were treated in a less better way than the Christians. And, and France did that in a lot of countries where, and of course, I'm not being nuanced here. Like there is so much to say, but I won't get into the details. And um, just to come back to the topic, what happened is um, at the end of, uh, of uh, the independence, uh, it, it was a soul lost. And uh, Macron, uh, during his presidential campaign, for the first time, called colonialism for what it is, a crime against humanity. Rapes were committed. Um, murder were committed. Uh, the first time we used gas chamber were against the Algerian Muslims by the General Bujo, right? In, uh, in the 18s, when uh, the French started to arrive in Algeria to colonize it, where we put a bunch of Algerian Muslims and uh, Algerian people, uh, women and men, who were fighting the colonizer, we put them into a cave and they started a fire to burn them. A gas chamber was used in Algeria at that time. And the General Bujot has a whole street in Paris after his name. Some consider him a national hero. I find it problematic personally as someone who is of Algerian background, <laughs> you know? and who is fully French, born and raised here. I don't have an issue of identity or whatever, but it is problematic. Like, how can you celebrate a person who is literally a murderer, <laughs> right? And uh, so Macron uh, declared that, um, you know, so colonization was a crime against humanity. He received so much hatred from the right and also from some in the left. No, it was like the golden age of France. Uh, les, les, uh, les effets positifs de la colonisation, uh, I mean, the positive effects of colonisation. What the heck is wrong with you guys? We still believe that actually colonisation, it was a mission civilisatrice. We are going to civilise, quote unquote, the savages. That was the rhetoric, by the way, at the time, right? And uh, some are still not over it. Even though, again, historians have done an incredible work, activists. But unfortunately, um, I mean, Macron also made some controversial comments on colonization. So it's not all like uh, perfect. But, and recently uh, he ordered a, um, a report to a uh, famous uh, historian, Benjamin Stora, uh, who so gave this report, I think it was, I mean, it was a good thing, I, but I didn't expect much, but you know, it was one step forward, 10 steps backwards. Uh, essentially the reports, you know, um, it was all about like trying to reconnect both countries, add status of Algerian heroes, yada, yada, but out of the question to apologize. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care about stages of Emir Abdel Qadr <laughs> if you don't apologize. Because for me, not apologizing means two things. A, that you don't think that what you've done before was wrong. And second, you know, the apology, I think, of course, to the Algerian people, but Algerians know what happened, right? But for the French, for, uh, France need to apologize at least for itself, 
to not repeat the same mistake in the future. Not necessarily talking about colonization, but you know, violation of human rights, how we treat minorities, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm like, no apology, then, then what? Okay, you're going to add status, you're going to open a museum. I mean, I'm not against that, don't get me wrong, but. And I think that also colonization has been used um, by both Algeria and France for their own political agenda. So in France to basically do what we talk about. And in Algeria, the, which is an authoritarian regime, right? A military one uh, who uses colonization to control its population and to justify certain action. And nobody, nobody buys it, seriously. Especially the youngest generation, like nobody buys it. And I think everybody wants to move forward, right? And the issue in this country is that when you call that out, um, and that's why post-colonial studies bother because we study things that are very tough, but that aren't necessary. Nobody is asking to, you know, uh, to, 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 to organize a coup against the French Republic, no. It's like, okay, this happened. We need to find a solution to repair what we have done to make our future better as French citizens. And that's something that the French establishment still refused to do. And uh, to connect everything with anti-Semitism, unfortunately, I mean, it still reminds me of the worst time uh, in the 18th, 19th century when the Jews, and again, I'm not comparing situation, like each situation is very unique and specific. We consider the Jews are incapable of being French citizen because they were Jewish and they were deemed incapable of being part of France because their culture, their religion was not compatible with, I mean, according to, uh, <laughs> of course, the elite at the time, uh, was not compatible with, uh, yeah, the French values, the French culture. So I think my point is, in each, um, across history, throughout history, uh, those who want to keep power and dominate always use a scapegoat to be able to advance their agenda and keep their power and use a good old divide and conquer. And I think we need to go beyond that because it is dangerous for democracy. It is dangerous uh, for, uh, for, for the rule of law as well. Uh, where do we stop? So yes, anti-Semitism must be fought without any, uh, I mean, Definitely, and any form of racism. And, and the thing is today, we still refuse to recognize anti-Muslim hatred for what it is, because it is acceptable to go after religion, a religion that, or a group of people that we deem incapable of integrating. And that's the same rhetoric we use during colonization. So I don't know if I completely answer your question, but I just threw some thoughts and, um, yeah, I hope I give justice to your uh, brilliant uh, analysis. And thank you. No, no, you did, you did. And I, I was while you were speaking, I, I opened some tabs just to remember. And so a number of things that the, I will definitely get into this more with Daniel, the the British activist I mentioned before. But the term Judeo-Christian A is a recent invention. It's it's not a historical one. Um, and B, as you said, it, it conveniently overlooks the fact that the Judeo bit has actually been rejected by the Christian bit for pretty much 90% of Europe's history. Um, and there are pretty good articles, including by, I should say, again, quote unquote, to be fair, but by people who are conservative uh, and who are Jewish, for example, saying why they're uncomfortable with the term Judeo-Christian due to that history. But another thing is that the whole... Uh, you know, the Jew within, the Muslim without. We also saw this, I have a previous episode, uh, episode 69 for those listening, uh, with uh, Aida Hozic from Bosnia. Um, it will be out by the time our episode is out. And one thing that's very obvious about the Muslim other, and of course we know what happened in Srebrenica and in Sarajevo and in Bosnia in general, uh, with that uh, story, the genocide. Um, the comparisons are never good. That's one thing I want, you, you said that like, you don't want to compare it to the, and comparing is never good in itself because it's imperfect, but it's useful in as much as it allows us to just see some of these parallels. 
and the whole this is not as bad as it, as the 30s was used i mean the french don't want to be compared to the americans but was used in america quite a lot and we saw trump for example saying that he will protect the jews against the muslims even as his supporters were chanting stuff like uh, Jews will not replace us in, you know, in Charlottesville and the attack on the synagogue, the massacre at the synagogue, as we know. Um, these things can be used by, you know, divide and conquer is indeed a very old strategy, but it doesn't get translated very well, even by people who are supposed to be doing it. It's a messy business. They're not as smart as they would like to believe. And that's not really the point. The point is power. The point is really to affect power. I interviewed um, some weeks ago uh, Raphael Arnaud. He is with the La Jeune Garde in, in Lyon, so an anti-fascist collective in Lyon. For those who don't know, Lyon is basically the birthplace of Génération Identitaire and the Identitarian Generation. Identitarian is a nicer way of saying fascist, in my opinion. Uh, Generation Identitaire was banned some weeks ago, uh, but they're still active in cities like Lyon. I will just link to that episode because he, he summarized things very well. Uh, one thing that it made me think of while we were talking, the reason why I wanted to bring it up, uh, other than just recommending people listening to, to, to it, it's a short one, it's like 10 minutes long, is that there are elections coming up next year. And uh, Le Pen's driving political energy is nationalism. Uh, she herself says it's about nationalism versus globalism. Anyone studying anti-Semitism knows the connotation of the term globalism. It actually literally started on far-right websites and far-right literature. It has a very, very old history because the idea of a globalist uh, as attached to a Jewish person pre-Holocaust but also post-Holocaust is that that Jewish person cannot be a nationalist cannot be French, cannot be Polish, cannot be etc, etc. Uh, the Dreyfus affair was one of the founding um, stories of Herzl and that's why Zionism came about, at least that's what he that's what he, he went into because for him, and I'm almost paraphrasing him here and I'm not supporting him whatsoever, but that's a paraphrase, it's just a historical fact that even in the land of enlightenment they rejected us. And so therefore we cannot stay here. That was his argument. And so this goes back, the, the notion of a globalist, of someone who cannot, who is not uh, able, who does not have loyalty to the homeland, because that's where it comes from, has deep, deep, deep anti-Semitic uh, roots and connotations. Now it doesn't have to manifest itself against Jewish persons on a daily basis. It doesn't have to. In, in America, you had, you know, Jared Kushner, who's Jewish, and Netanyahu, who's Jewish, supporting the Trump administration. I mean, it doesn't matter that much and on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's the underlying authoritarian logic that gets replicated. And what it does, and this is why I kind of transition to our conversation, what it does, especially, I mean, other than it being bad in itself and... Uh, leading many Jewish persons who understand those coded languages because it's not very coded if you're familiar with your own history as a Jewish person. Um, the fear that this would generate and et cetera, et cetera, like this being bad in itself. But it also says something about society that we are imposing, we those in power are imposing a certain vision on society and we who have the mechanisms of the state have the means to at least implement to effect it on these bodies, in this case, Muslims especially, but also possibly Jews. I mean, I, I really think that they are, uh, if this continues, if Le Pen gets in power, uh, I don't think they will be safe either. Unfortunately, many are led to believe that they would be by scapegoating Muslims, but that's not how things work, unfortunately, for everyone. Um, so my question to you is maybe more of a, you know, personal question, if that's okay. Um, how concerned are you about the... The fact that there is a multicultural reality, regardless of what people who hate it want to believe, the fact that it exists means that they're going to do all kind of cards on the table that will be available to them depending on how much power they get and how much that tendency gets normalized by the time of the elections and after the election. But just like, how worried are you personally, maybe not personally, maybe just people you know, maybe friends, maybe networks, maybe connections? Uh, because I'm I mean, I'm of Arab origins, 
uh, I'm not Muslims, but most Islamophobes don't know the difference anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And I live in Geneva, which is close to France, has different tendencies for sure, but it's not that far away for me. It's literally surrounded by France. And so I kind of, I'm seeing it from without in some ways, but also from within. I have family in Paris and in, in Marseille. And these are, these are concerns of mine, both personally, um, but also just generally, because if this takes over France, it has connotations for the world in the same way as what we saw in the UK and in US. And personally, I think that it may have bigger consequences on the world if it sticks over France just due to the role of France within the EU. But that's a different debate. So just, yeah, how how worried are you? Or like, how much are you comfortable sharing? You don't have to share everything. No, of course. Um, uh, I, I will add uh, before answering that, that also anti-Muslim bigotry is a business too. Uh, it makes money quite literally. Actually, I would uh, recommend... Um, if I may, uh, to read a report um, written uh, by uh, Wajahad Ali. Uh, he's an uh, American uh, author and analyst and um, called Fear Inc. And he analyzes actually the phenomenon of Islamophobia and basically from where the money comes from and how, you know, the machinery behind it. And uh, this report is absolutely brilliant. I I think uh, it was done with uh, the New America um, Institute. And I highly recommend it because you can see that in France too. And I must say bigotry makes the buzz. It makes money. Who cares about the truth? Like just throw like a horrific thing. It will create an audience, which means it will get ads. And I mean, uh, so, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that. Um, as for, um, you know, multiculturalism values, et cetera, uh, it's very interesting. And I will get to the feelings after, um, you know, in the end, uh, vulnerable people, so minorities, and in that case, Muslim are just asking to be treated as equal with their fellow uh, Frenchmen and women. They are actually requiring laicity to apply to them, as in the state doesn't interfere with religious affairs and vice versa. They just want to be free. You know, it's not too much for asking. I'm not saying everybody's perfect, that Muslims communities here have issues. I'm not saying that. And I think every community is have issues. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to, uh, to say that everything is perfect, but who is essentializing these communities? You know, we keep saying we don't see race and multiculturalism, boo-hoo. Uh, but who is talking about the Muslims, the Arabs, the immigrants who are take, who are not only at the same time stealing our jobs, but also living on state welfare? It's like, I mean, in that case, I'm sorry, like immigrants are, are have skills. <laughs> like, you know, that's a foreign narrative. They steal our jobs, no, they steal our ways. <laughs> Can I That's just so good. interrupt you yeah, and sure. mention um, there is such a thing called Schrodinger's immigrant. I don't know if you know it. Oh, it speaks. Yeah, uh, I it's think. I, uh, go like, ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's, Im yeah. Immigrant are both very lazy and they're also taking everyone's jobs. It's just, it's a magic. It's amazing. It's a. I, they I'm, all should be hired. Yeah, I think they should. <laughs> I mean, if you're lazy but are still capable of accomplishing all of that, I mean, hey, like. <laughs> You're the CEO right now, <laughs> you know? I mean, just to say, you know, who is essentializing this population? We keep saying, we don't see race, but the Muslims. Or like, if something happened, like if there is a murder or an attack and I'm assault, uh, this person originally from, uh, I don't know, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, whatever. I'm, yeah, he's French, but no, we are going to give the country, I mean, this sort of profiling. So in the end, who is like using categories while we are supposed to be a universal, a universalist country with universal values that don't see race or ethnicity or religion? You know, I mean, the state is not doing the job. And I think that uh, those who actually feel incredibly insecure are those in power. Again, those who have, because they know that, uh, you know, the balance is not in their favor. Like I said, they still consider these people are incapable of integrating. And as for my worried, I'm terrified because 
uh, I didn't mention it previously. I'm not an activist. Uh, I'm not doing like, I respect activists that are doing an incredible job. Uh, I'm the boring one, uh, just analyzing <laughs> policies and, and uh, the law and trying to explain things, right? And, but I know the law and I know what it is capable of. It can do great things, but it also can do the worst. It's a bit like, you know, having some sort of uh, magic powers. You can do good. <laughs> uh, like if I'm using like some fantasy like comparison, but like uh, you can do extremely good and you can do extremely bad things. And we have seen in the past how the law or even the constitution can commit the worst. I mean, uh, if you look at the Holocaust, uh, the way we treated Jews, it was legal. I mean, it was in the law, <laughs> right? Uh, we were talking about the Vichy regime. Yes, it was the French state who, like lawmakers, passed laws, right? So just because it's legal doesn't mean it's morally, it's morally acceptable because it's not, of course. And unfortunately, I, I see that those who know how to use this tool, if not controlled, if not called out, if not pressured, We'll try to find ways to go after you because of who you are and to make you, uh, you know, uh, public enemy number one, uh, just because, you know, you are of North African background, Muslims, etc. Now, I, I also want to be hopeful because we also have, I'm not saying it's perfect because definitely not, but the judiciary as well is trying to do its job. But when you have lawmakers who pass crazy laws, the judiciary also have to interpret them in a way that also is respectful toward the law. But I mean, maybe that's the difference with, you know, like the 30s or the 40s is like today, we do have mechanism of protection of human rights. Like whether it's our different courts, like on the Supreme level, even though, to be honest, like, okay, I'm not giving names, but some are really not doing their jobs. <laughs> but we also have, you know, for example, the European Court of Human Rights. And, you know, so there are mechanisms. And today we also have international organization to protect human rights. But unfortunately, we see that it's all about pressure and diplomacy. I mean, in other parts of the world where genocides are being committed. I mean, look at what happened in China, for example, with the Uyghurs or in Myanmar with a, a Rohingya, right? You call out and nothing happens. And actually that worries me because, you know, just because we are, a, I hate that word, but advanced democracy doesn't mean it can happen to us. And that's the problem I think in this country. And I think it's not just France really, it's across democracies in general. Um, we take liberties for granted. And we do not understand that it's an ongoing fight to protect and preserve them. And unfortunately, usually those who realize that are those who will be affected most if those liberties, civil liberties were attacked, naming minorities, whether it's like the Muslims or the Jews or women or LGBTQ plus people, you know, all the groups that are vulnerable because of their, you know, of who they are. So, yes, I'm extremely concerned. And actually what concerns me even more is those who can have a voice and yet remain silent. And I think that... Those who remain silent are even more guilty if something happens. I understand that sometimes it's very hard. I'm not saying go in the street and go before, you know, whatever. But if you have the power to do something, at least use it behind the scenes. Try to do something. And some are just silent because, oh, it's none of my concern. Or uh, I don't want to get in and have problems, you know. Uh, and from across, you know, all fields, like even in academia, it's like you write about it in your like legal journal that nobody will read really. Uh, and you 
but you still refuse to, uh, and I'm not saying that everyone do it because some are doing it. Okay, I don't want to make a generality. There are extraordinary people here who are taking risks, who are being harassed on social media just because they dare to speak out. But those who remain silent, um, I hope they will be able to look at themselves in the mirror if things get worse and out of control. Yeah, thanks for that. Um... Yeah, it, it's part of why I'm also worried. It's it's never it's on. You never need a majority to do horrible things. You never need fifty plus percent of the population. That has almost never happened. You almost never have more than fifty percent of the population anyway. Uh, without being too generalizing either, there are different scenarios in different cases. Uh, the reason why I'm so worried about France, as I said, other than the personal link, is just I I'm worried about how a lot of it is kind of happening below the surface just because the Anglo world is not covering it uh, well enough because for the most part they just don't cover France very well and vice versa, I should say. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that that's part of this conversation. It's part of the, the conversation I'll have with Daniel on, on anti-Semitism and on the left in the UK. It's uh, authoritarianism, the conversation I had with Ida on the legacy of Bosnia. It wasn't just about Bosnia, it was the the legacy of that situation legally as well. She's a, she's a scholar. Um, so that's sort of like, I will wrap it up in some way. I will kind of try and have a, I try and have a positive-ish notes uh, towards the end so I don't depress everyone listening to me. Uh, but one thing I will say is that, I mean, you mentioned it yourself, institutions are better than they were back then. So I don't want to I don't want people to just freak out and immediately go on a uh, panic mode and just try and find a way out. I will say that the notion that it cannot happen here is a is a false one. It's a wrong one. It it may not happen in the exact same way. Uh, the it may be defined uh, differently, but something can happen here, and that something is what needs to uh, be opposed. And the, it can't happen here is a very it, it's a novel by Sinclair uh, and. Uh, I think he imagined like how a dictator would be in America, you know, time of Hitler. Uh, it can or it could happen here is a podcast by Robert Evans that I will recommend uh, in which he basically uh, went through scenarios that was in 2018. I think he released it of how authoritarianism can come to America, um, culminating in the way he spoke about the rise of militias and potentially a coup on the capital, which is what we saw earlier this year. Um, so a lot of people have been seeing the signs for a long time, and I think this benefits uh, the fight, let's put it very broadly, or the struggle against um, authoritarianism broadly. There's quite a lot, a lot of um, groups, if not now, is a group that comes up, an American Jewish group that, that basically, if not now, when, if not me, who, like that's the, that's the quote. So that's that's why I will end it. I don't think it's all uh, doom and gloom. I never do, or else there's kind of no point doing this. But it is it is a concern. It's a real one. Uh, and with that, if that's okay, I don't know if you have three books to recommend. Sure. If I may uh, just chime in, like on a positive note as well, uh, if if yes, that's okay. Um, yeah, also, uh, I think that uh, what is currently going on in France is that, and I often say that. Uh, France cannot keep its dirty laundry at home anymore. F because, you know, for years it was, oh, France, it's like uh, the Eiffel Tower and macaron and croissant and whatever. Uh, because we didn't have access as well to the media and social media were not really a thing even like, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago? I mean, it was not mainstreamed as it is right now. And today, I think that I'm not saying it's easy, don't get me wrong, but stories are getting out of the borders. People are calling out, like, and you and compared again, like to 10, 10 years ago, as recent as 10 years ago, uh, you wouldn't have any coverage of these issues in, for example, the Anglo American press. I'm taking the Anglo American press because that's the one I, I know better, right? But um, because there was a barrier of the language, etc. But today, like, you know, the population learn languages and are capable of sharing their stories, their experience. And France is shamed. And if there is something that us French are very productive 
a bad look. It's our image. We have that thing like a rayonnement de la France à l'étranger, which is very pompous and arrogant, but that's a thing. Uh, the I don't even know how to translate that, but the, the shining, like the- The shining of France. The shining across the world. Across the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how basically, you know, we are the nation, the, the, the bastion of human rights, the enlightenment, etc. And yet here we are. And the problem is, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful country with a lot of potential, but we are basically ruining it. And France hates that. French authorities hate the fact that those stories are out there because they do not control the narrative anymore. And it is shameful for a country that prides itself in being the country of human rights, quote unquote. So again, the very fact that stories are being shared is also a huge positive thing, element to, you know, to try to make things uh, better. I mean, look, you have the New York Times now who translate their articles in French. It's not a, like, it is done in, on, in purpose, I think, right? So yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add that, that uh, when there is a real, there is a way. And I truly believe and hope that at some point things will get better if, if we keep um, fighting for civil liberties. But because again, it goes beyond Muslims. It's everybody at some point as humans, as citizens, uh, as uh, who are going to be affected if uh, nothing is done about it. Sorry for that. No, 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 at all. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I think it's a good note. I mean, it's, I think it's a good uh, way of ending the official conversation, <laughs> official episode. But before doing that, if we can enter, uh, do you have three books to recommend that we can kind of talk about? Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would try not to give away too much either, if you don't mind. So. So uh, the first book uh, for all of you nerds um, is uh, <laughs> uh, a book uh, from, um, I take some notes just to be sure that I have all um, elements from um, a Canadian uh, political scientist, uh, Nader Hashmi. Uh, and the name, uh, I don't know if you uh, know about him. Sorry, um, I'm, la I'm, la I'm laughing because I just interviewed him two weeks ago. <laughs> He's amazing, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's gonna be the episode will be out by the time our episode is out. Oh, that's awesome! There you go. I didn't do it on purpose. Like, see, like uh, the stars align. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, his book, um, Islam, Secularism, and Liberal Democracy uh, Towards a Democratic Theory for Muslim Societies, it's uh, from 2009 at Oxford uh, University Press. Essentially, uh, his book is very complex, but so accessible as well. It's really well written uh, with a lot of um, different, it's a comparative study as well. And he um, kind of challenges uh, the, the question, um, again, from a comparative perspective and also with a lot of historical elements um, about um, um, the, the, the the process of the tensions between Islam and liberal democracies and challenge uh, these uh, widely beliefs, these uh, kind of stereotypes really uh, that argue that, and I think it's connected to what we have been discussed, right? The so-called incompatibility of religion with uh, a liberal democracy. And it's very interesting because he takes like, a, he goes through a, a lot of uh, studies, especially France, uh, who else? Uh, Turkey as well, uh, Indonesia. I mean, it's really fascinating and it gives you like sneak peeks at how uh, he processed to bring some sort of fresh, fresh ideas, uh, a fresh analysis on the issue. And uh, it's very timely. It's from 2009, but I think it's still uh, very, uh, very, very timely. So uh, it, it's academic. Right, it's not a novel or whatsoever, but sometimes you need like nerds are very needed too. Like I think you know, <laughs> I'm among those, so um, that would be my first recommendation. Uh, my second one uh, is that okay if it's in French? I'm sorry, like yes, there, there's no rule, and I'm just making it up as I go along. So go for it. Oh, awesome, <laughs> excellent. So uh, my second is uh, a book from uh, Nisreen Slawi. Uh, she is a journalist um, called Illegitime, Illegitimate, and um, she basically uh, narrates um, 
her path and her struggles coming from an immigrant family. She's French of Moroccan background. Uh, her family, so um, uh, she, like, her family is like, uh, you know, from the working class. And, you know, navigate, she tried to narrate how she navigates through, uh, you know, those origins, this background, and she managed to get into Sciences Po, which is one of the most elitist um, school of higher education in the country. I think everybody knows what Sciences Po is. Uh, and um, yeah, that's basically her journey and how tough this journey is and how she became a journalist after, I mean, she studied journalism there and uh, how even after studying at Sciences Po, you know, she's still like, struggling with that and how she's perceived even in the milieu, right, in, in her field of uh, work. Uh, so it's it's beautiful and um, really highly recommended. I don't want to give away too much, uh, but it's like the idea came from, like, I mean, um, she, she published like some interview she had with her grandpa who cannot um, speak French and um, it's beautiful. So I, and I think it speaks volume about you know, uh, the current situation in France about social mobility, how in the end, the elitist schools as well are still reserved for the elite and how it is hard for the minorities to get into them. Even if they get into them, they will be accused of, you know, benefiting from what we call, I hate that term, positive discrimination programs, uh, which I won't even compare with the American one because I think it's a false and terrible comparison. And how in the end it's like if i cannot access the elite how do you want the system to change as well and at the time when emmanuel macron announced that he wanted to end the uh, école nationale d'administration the ena to tackle those issues i'm like what good it does to basically you know remove an institution and then what like the issues have to be tackled i think at the root starting in, you know, with housing and social issues and, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, racism, discrimination, um, the situation in the banlieue, uh, you know, the poorest neighborhood uh, in the country. And um, yeah, anyway, highly recommend it. And the third one is a beautiful and very powerful book by Rashid Zerouki, 2020 at uh, Robert Laffont, uh, called Les Incasables. I don't know how to translate that, but meaning the people we cannot put into a box, like place in an environment because they are, they do not fit. Yeah, those who cannot fit, the unfitted. I don't know, it's a neologist, but you know. And uh, Rashid basically tells his journey as a teacher in a public school, but he teaches specifically in what we call a segpa, so the sections of adapted general education professional training, and usually these are kids who, who are in great difficulties, uh, whether it's because of health issues or social issues, economic issues, and they, they're like even within their families, sometimes they are like in uh, foster families. I mean, they, life has not been kind to them. And, um, and I know even when I used to go to school, the SECPA were considered as the people you should not deal with or be involved with or be friends with. Uh, one of my closest friends was in a SECPA, right? And he's still a friend of mine, you know, and, and yeah, the they are marginalized. And he's telling his story as, um, as a teacher in such an environment and all the lessons of life he learned thanks to his kids. And he starts with his own origin. So he is, um, he's French Moroccan. So he was born in Morocco and, and lived there until he came to France. I don't want to give away too much, but it's, it's an homage to public school. It's an homage to public education, public schools that are today being insulted, uh, disregarded, like, we treat public school like things that are worthless 
I mean, just how look how we teach teachers during COVID, right? I mean, uh, it's 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 horrific, and uh, I really highly recommend it. And I hope uh, these two books, who are written in French, will at some point be translated because um, they really are great. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, amazing. Uh, I'm sorry. Thanks a lot for your time. This has really been amazing. Yeah, I hope it was useful. I hope I made... I'm sorry, English is not my first language, so sometimes it might be... You were, you were more than okay. fine. Everything was okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Fire These Times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.